Hi there, and welcome back. For those who tuned into the September event and for those who are joining us for the first night time, my name is Mark Hennick. We have attendees participating across Canada and around the globe, so I'd like to take these opening moments together to acknowledge the lands on which we're hosting this event. These lands include traditional territories of many nations. Canada Health InfoWay recognizes that the, the many injustices experienced by the Indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada, they continue to affect their health and well-being. Canada Health InfoWay respects that Indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. So I'd like to invite all attendees to reflect on the territories that you're calling in from uh, as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, to forging new culturally safe relationships, and to contributing to reconciliation. Now, InfoWay is taking part in a community engagement project in support of Native Canadian Centres of Toronto. We welcome attendees to donate via their online donation portal. The NCCT is a charitable organization that empowers the Indigenous communities in Toronto by providing programs that support their spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental well-being. Now, that uh, spiritual, emotional, physical, mental well-being piece became very uh, prevalent for me, very obvious for me, growing up as a young man on the East Coast of Canada. I'd like to share a little bit with you about my experience uh, with mental health problems and illnesses just in the next four or five minutes or so, right out the top, so that way you can get a bit of a better understanding of why I'm here hosting this for you today. I grew up, uh, you know, my, my cultural uh, uh, background uh, growing up in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, was that I was Irish Catholic, and by that I mean I have 31 aunts and uncles. <laughs> we, we had an incredibly uh, interconnected family, certainly well before uh, social media existed to interconnect us. And I think that the wonderful strength of that was that we got to know everybody uh, in our small town uh, via people we were directly related with. In fact, we were probably related to half the small town anyway. Now, the downside of that, however, uh, as many people from small towns know, uh, is that we share in each other's glory, we share e in each other's successes, but we also share rumor. We also share talking about the struggles that people are going through, and at that time, uh, people preferred to talk uh, a lot about people's mental health problems and illnesses. So when I started to struggle as young as about 12 years old with depression, with anxiety, and then at 12, suicidality, I felt like my entire family knew. I felt like, therefore, my entire community knew. But nobody would reach out and connect to me about it. Nobody would talk to me about it, at least not directly, and at least not in a way that I really understood. Now, over the next several years, compounded by this silence and the stigma of being the so-called crazy kid, uh, I felt like I was hopeless. I was helpless. I would just be broken the rest for the rest of my life, as the Irish Catholic, uh, my Irish Catholic grandmother uh, would tell me, maybe this is just your cross to bear. I didn't want to bear that cross. So after more than half a dozen times in and out of hospital for, a subsequent, for increasingly dangerous suicide attempts, I finally tried to kill myself off of a bridge that stretched uh, across my hometown, across an old steel plant that had long since been abandoned. I picked that spot, like many people choose many suicide hotspots, because it was alone. It was disconnected from everybody. I didn't think anybody would be able to come and stop me. And if it wasn't for a stranger who stopped on the side of the bridge, despite all the signs saying not to stop, there were no crisis number signs, there were no suicide prevention barricades, but there were signs saying not to pull over and stop your car. But this complete stranger did that anyway. He stopped, and as I stood on an inch and a half or so of concrete over about a 30-foot drop to the ground, he stopped and talked to me. And I could tell from the way he talked that he wasn't a mental health professional. He wasn't a psychologist or a psychiatrist, a social worker, a psych nurse. Or I had talked to them all. <laughs> I talked to dozens of them over the years to that point. He was just a stranger who I think asked me about my cat. He asked me about my pets and my interests. He asked me about my, the subjects that I uh, enjoyed at school, my few friends that I had, my family members. He asked me about the things that I was passionate about, that I was interested about, all the things that I maybe someday could be. 
if I didn't just jump off that bridge that night. Now, he stalled me long enough, I think, that the police eventually did arrive, and so did crowds. Crowds had gathered at the barricades that the police had set up, and I remember a group of young men shouted out to me from the barricades to jump. One called me a coward. And it didn't matter in that moment that I had this stranger who I couldn't really see. He was just wearing a light brown jacket. That's all that I could remember. Because these other strangers who stood on the sidelines told me to jump. They drove disconnection by choosing to stand on the sidelines and shout out to somebody who was vulnerable. When they did, I let go of the railing and I started to fall. And immediately I saw that stranger's light brown jacket, the one who had my back, who had been standing there talking to me and connecting with me. He wrapped his arm around my chest and pulled me backwards so hard that when my back hit the railing behind me, my feet flew out over the edge. And I just dangled over the side of the bridge for a minute until he pulled, pulled me back to safety. I was sent back to hospital again, the place where everybody knew my name, the place where I felt so alone. But when I was discharged, a few things had changed for me. First, the receptionist told me that it was the first day of spring. I don't know why that mattered to me, and it wouldn't become significant until many years later. The second thing that changed was that it was the last time that I ever tried to kill myself. It wasn't because I had suddenly found the right medication or suddenly found the right type of psychotherapy. All that stuff would come slowly and much, much later. But I was stuck with this image of these two men, these two strangers, who made two very different choices when watching that same situation. One chose to stand on the sidelines and drive me away, to push me away, to push me over. And one chose to have my back, to reach out literally and save my life. So ladies and gentlemen, in our conversations today, you'll be able to hear the rest of my story elsewhere. My story is everywhere else, I think, online. But I hope that you take this opportunity to make the choice to be the stranger who reaches out to others. You might save their life. Now, I want to uh, come back to our, our script here and, and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the self-care things that had helped me before we get into our program in earnest. Sometimes I've found over the years of speaking across Canada, indeed around the world, doing media all around the world, raising awareness of mental health, of suicide, of connection and disconnection and interconnection between us, I've learned that sometimes the simplest or seemingly simplest, I've come to know them as trivial triggers, the seemingly simplest things uh, can, can drive people to get help. That's a good thing. That's what we want. So if anything that comes up today, no matter how quote unquote trivial you might think it is, no matter how unimportant it seems, I want you to know that there is help available uh, wherever you are in your journey. So if you have a young person in your life, uh, please reach out to Kids Help Phone. When I was 12, 13, 14 years old, I relied on Kids Help Phone all the time. I called in many, many times. And they're still in existence today, of course, thriving. They're one of the, the most reliable uh, mental health resources for young people uh, and indeed into college age um, that we have. And, and we're really lucky as a country to have them. So please uh, encourage your kids to reach out to Kids Help Phone. If you're an adult, reach out to distress centers. Uh, uh, or Canada Crisis Services, uh, please take some training. Uh, you can get in touch with the Canadian Mental Health Association, cmha.ca. They have branches and divisions in every single uh, province and, and uh, community. So please get in touch with uh, any of those resources, or if you need something more specific, get in touch with me on social media. I'm at Mark Hennick, at M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And while I can't uh, do any kind of crisis intervention with you or counseling with you, of course, I'm not qualified to do that. I'm more than happy uh, to help you find out the resources that are available in your community. Now, let's get to it. Uh, I have a few quick notes that I wanna cover before we get into some of the, we've got some really wonderful speakers here for you today, and I know you're really gonna enjoy them. But first, on translation services. Uh, I know we have some uh, Francophones who are joining us today who would prefer uh, some translation services. So we have simultaneous translation available to you in French. Uh, and if you have not already found the connection details, just take a look there on your screen. Uh, you'll be able to see them there and you can get simultaneous translation. Canada Health InfoWay is also very proud to convene events which adhere to the patient's included accreditation. The InfoWay Partnership Fall Series patient advisor is Anne O'Riordan. Anne has been involved in the planning and the program uh, will continue 
uh, to work with them on the series moving forward. So, and thank you so much. You know, we say in the mental health space, nothing about us without us. Uh, so in order to to uh, have our voice heard at the table, we have to be at the table. So I'm so grateful to you, and for being involved in this project. The InfoWay Partnerships Fall Series has been made possible thanks to a partnership with, uh, thanks to partnerships rather, within the industry. So on behalf of Canada Health InfoWay, thank you to Access 2022 Alliance founding sponsors. We've got some polls this time again. I know how much you like polls and being able to share your thoughts with us. So please, I hope you do that as well. Uh, we're gonna be looking for your thoughts throughout the event. Uh, the online chat moderator uh, will uh, let you know when the polls are live. So please, we really rely on your participation. It really makes these events that much richer. Speaking of the chats, uh, we welcome you to engage with your fellow participants uh, and attendees uh, in the platform chat. Uh, or by connecting via the attendees list as well. This is these kinds of events, you know, we might be uh, physically distant, but we don't have to be socially distant in this way. We can still connect socially, and this is one great way to do that. Q&A, we're gonna try our best uh, to be able to have some time for, and we've planned some time uh, to allow for questions at the conclusion of each presentation. So please submit those questions on that uh, Q&A box on the right. You can also upvote questions that you want to move to the top. That's a really great, efficient way of doing that. We're going to try our best to get as many uh, of those done as we can at the end of each presentation. Now, let's get into the program. It's my pleasure to introduce the next uh, session for you today. I'd like to welcome Mel Michael Green back. We heard from uh, Michael Green last week, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say to uh, this week as well. Michael is the president and CEO of Canada Health InfoWay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Whoops, a second. Can you hear me okay? Um, oh, great, sorry. Yeah, sorry about that. I just saw a, a mute sign on, on the... Uh, on the uh, microphone there. Great. Well, thanks very much, Mark. And, you know, very impactful story. And, you know, I'm sure you've helped a whole load of people since then. And thank you so much again for hosting our session today. And I know we've got a very important session about mental health later. And uh, I look forward to that session as well. So uh, my presentation, I'm going to be focusing on virtual care and the impact that COVID-19 has had on virtual care. And as you know, virtual care is one of the key focus areas of digital health that InfoA has. And this has been an area that's been quickly evolving as the healthcare landscape has really evolved over the last few months. I don't think I can remember when healthcare was so much at the center of things. In Canada, it's often been one of the issues that many People want to talk about the election, but it's never really made it to a big election issue. Um, but now I think the health ministry across the country, as well as the federal government, must be some of the busiest, if not the most busiest, uh, ministries around. And that's the same for many other countries. So with my presentation, and I'm just trying to... Right. Whoops. Ah. Doesn't seem to be. Oh, now I've got it. Yeah, great. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, well, thanks for that. And um, 
as earlier and mentioned uh, by Mark, you know, in for way before I start my presentation, we've been trying to think how we can really live the, the mission of um, involving patients and caregivers. And we uh, came up with this statement and I wanted to read it today. So at InfoA, we recognize the unwavering commitment, essential impact patients, families and caregivers have and will always have on the Canadian healthcare system. Canada Health InfoA pledges to continuously listen to the perspectives and learn from the lived experience of patients, families and caregivers to ensure respectful collaboration in the work we do and influence. And we look forward to building true partnerships and acknowledge, acknowledging shared successes. And, you know, I think in every meeting, we're trying to be respectful of that and to ensure that we do have patient, family and caregiver input. And it's something that we're continually be striving to um, ensure that we kind of meet that goal in everything we do. So anyway, leading on from there, um, I wanted to talk a little bit first about some of the drivers, both from a global and then a Canadian perspective. I've also got some research work that I'm going to share with you. And then I'm going to share some of the activities that InfoWay is kind of working on in partnership with many of you on this call and our other partners across the country in various different uh, segments of the healthcare system. And so the drive is probably no surprise to everybody when we look at these drivers. So basically people are living longer, they're getting more um, chronic diseases, there's cost escalation, resources are always a, a key um, criteria to, to be concerned with, the escalating cost of healthcare. At the same time, patient expectations are getting higher. People want to have more of a consumer experience with the health system, whether it's a public system as we have in Canada, or whether it's a private system in, in other um, areas. Then we have these new disasters coming along. And so we've got uh, COVID-19, the one that we're experiencing at the moment, and it looks like we'll be experiencing for some time to come. And with that comes other increased burdens, and in particular, a focus on mental health. And uh, in this time of when people are socially isolated, and also when addicts, for example, find it difficult to get to treatment centres, difficult to get involved in their, um, you know, peer-to-peer -peer meetings and so on. So it's very heavy pressure on people, whether it's through direct illness from the virus or whether it's the impact that it has on the individuals and, and families. So when we specifically look at virtual care, you know, there's been an unprecedented growth in demand for virtual care. And the saying here, InfoWay can play a central role to help manage the crisis and recovery. And in a small way, we can. This was actually um, a quote from uh, one of our government stakeholders during a recent um, survey that we, we performed. And it was identified that there's a, a, a kind of role we can play in helping to drive and coordinate the adoption of virtual care. So we've seen that uh, during um, COVID, the initial kind of uh, outbreaks and everything, there wasn't good kind of national data collection. And it really showed that there was some gaps in the system in terms of getting pandemic information fast. I think there's obviously been a lot of improvement over time, but uh, there's a focus on how we can really understand the trajectory of the disease and so on. There was initially high demand for virtual care services. 60% of patients in Canada converted their appointments to virtual. That's phenomenal. But a lot of it was done with band-aids, really, where people were scrabbling to use phones and other technologies. And there was some very good examples of best practice, I think, across the country. But one of the things it's shown is this won't continue on its own that to really see a good growth in virtual care, we need to have the change management and other systems in place and have a national strategy to do this. People have got new perceptions about virtual care through this increased use and new demands going forward. New technologies are coming out and we can see the ones that are performing particularly well and look at the ones that maybe need some improvement, look at the focus areas where where does virtual care really make sense. 
And then in the end, we're based mainly on the fee-per-service kind of model. And so to support new techniques like uh, virtual care, we need new reimbursement models as well to make that possible to roll it out across Canada. So what does this mean specifically in Canada? So again, as we know, we need to have improved access to primary care. We've also got a focus that we have to place on rural and indigenous populations. And the rural issues can be troublesome as well for new technologies like virtual care if we don't have bandwidth in, in place. So there's a role for infrastructure investments as well. In Canada, we're used to having to wait, to look at wait times for services. And uh, these new emergencies have kind of exacerbated those issues and demonstrated where virtual care can help solve a number of these issues, can help provide access to primary care physicians, can potentially help to bend that cost curve and improve the patient experience as we deal with these new emergencies. Back in March, when this all happened, I remember in early March, I was actually in Florida at the time, and I had an early call with um, Deputy Lucas of Health Canada, and to discuss really how Canada Health Infoway might help with the crisis. It seemed like a, a moment where we could try and ensure that we were focusing our resources to help the provinces and territories cope with, with the um, outbreak. Um, we made a modest investment, I guess, in the whole terms of things, but a big investment for Infoway where we managed to refocus immediately 35 million and uh, the Infoway team um, contacted all the provinces and territories. Uh, we had a lot of meetings and immediately be a, a, were able to identify the priorities that the pro provinces had in implementing their own virtual care strategies. And in particular, we worked with them to help them put in place virtual care solutions like video visits, home health monitoring, remote patient monitoring as well, particularly in the areas of mental health and also in primary care. And that um, momentum has continued. And when we talked about the growth of virtual care, I thought it'd be interesting to look at uh, where virtual care is being used, how it's being used, and what, uh, what the best kind of use cases are. And um, in conjunction with Leger, we've done a tracking survey that was started um, in March. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the one of the first results showed that six out of 10 encounters were being done virtually. So there was a very quick uptake of virtual care. In the first case, largely um, telephone, followed by Visio visits. And what we've seen since then is that number has kind of gone back a little bit. But also, if you remember, after the initial surge of the outbreak, there was a bit of a pause where we seem to have it under control. And then recently, we're going into this second wave, particularly in the most populous provinces. And so I think it's really reasserting the need for virtual services. And again, it, it talks about the need to have systems in place to learn from best practice to try and make this a great experience both for the patients and also for the providers going forward. But the good thing is that 84% of people who used it said that they would use more technology tools to manage their health. And um, during the pandemic, it had really showed the ability of virtual care um, to, in, as alternatives to seeing doctors and other caregivers um, and providers in person. So over the next couple of slides, I'm going to look at some of the analysis we had of the visits and reasons for having virtual visits. And, um, you know, this one particular slide focuses on why people weren't having any kind of healthcare visit in the, in the per past month, which was done um, in July and August, I believe. So the first one was the fear of catching COVID-19, of going to a doctor's office and being exposed to the disease, kind of put an awful lot of people in the, off in the first place of going to, to have a visit. And then a lot of people self-medicated 
is that good? You know, I'm sure a lot of people, and we've seen reports of how people with heart disease and so on have kind of put up with their conditions, but really with a cost which is potentially fatal. And then finally, people found it difficult to find other providers that, that had online services. And as you see, there's a number of um, issues here. People don't have regular healthcare providers. They didn't know that there was access for their specific health issues and so on. So communications is also a very important uh, tool in any strategy. And then when people were using health, uh, primary, uh, sorry, virtual care, what were the primary uh, kind of applications for that? And the two most popular ones were, first of all, mental health. And it's great that we've got a discussion later on the mental health topic. And as you know, Infoware has partnered with Kids Help Phone on a number of these activities. And then primary care, the entry to the system. And of course, virtual care also has an impact on a number of other conditions as well. But I think our particular focus is on the gateway to the system, mental health, which are two of the, the biggest use cases we've seen. In terms of actually consulting with a care provider virtually, what was the reasons for doing it? What drove people to do that? Um, first of all, was the only option. The only option was to get a, get a virtual visit. And then other than that, it was a safer, safer option that we saw earlier in terms of you know, avoiding the um, possibility of catching the disease by interaction with other people. And then also it was offered by uh, the regular doctor. So a number of people found that their regular doctor or provider offered virtual services and they were able to take advantage of that. And, in, and then also other benefits, you know, it saves time, it's the best fit and so on. So there's a lot of key reasons for people using virtual care. And then in terms of um, why did people go and do in-person visits? And I think the key reasons for that was one, um, they weren't able to find a virtual offering. So their regular doctor and provider was not offering virtual services. And also many people felt the particular condition they had wasn't best suited for virtual care. And one would certainly recognize virtual care can't do everything. It's very important for us to identify the key um, value places for virtual care and really focus on those. And then the communications comes up again. It, it, people didn't know it was an offering. So there's a lot we can learn from these statistics in terms of going forward. And when you look at people who had their virtual care visit, what were the main um, outcomes from that? And it's not a surprise to see that prescription renewals, new prescriptions were the top two. And then reassurance, anxiety comes after that. And then finally, air, or, the next priorities were booking lab tests, getting referrals. So this is giving us a picture of the common issues that can be dealt with quite effectively by virtual care. And uh, there's definitely opportunity to extend this as we go forward. So what's the likelihood of people using virtual care after COVID-19? And I think it's up to us as healthcare professionals and also people involved in the virtual care, the digital health fields, to really see how we can identify those areas that will help improve the selective use of virtual care going forward. 45% of people said, yes, they would use it again. 34% of people are sitting on the fence, they may use it, they may not. And then 21% said no. So it'd be interesting to see why those views come across. How can we put more people into the likely box and reduce the number of no's? Is it because they had a negative experience? Was it because they couldn't find the um, technology, the availability? Um, it's very important for us to understand how we can potentially improve virtual care. Now, looking at a number of those areas, and we have done research and consultations um, in terms of how we can sustain virtual care going forward. And some of the key issues that one faces are, first of all, the leadership issues, clinical, political leadership. Um, that's got to be in place. There's got to be the motivation in the public system at the very top to utilize this technology. Patient advocacy, if patients want it, that's a very, patients can drive behavior by 
advocating for this technology. When clinicians use, use uh, these different tools, it totally changes their whole workflow. And so change management is an important topic to, to address. How can we help people adopt new practices to make best use of virtual care te technology? We've seen a number of the provinces put in place new methods of remuneration, which is fantastic. And we need to see this continue going forward. And then we've got to think of other issues like how can we get access for vulnerable populations? What can we do to enhance federal, provincial and territorial collaboration? Something I think we've seen over the last few months that's never been higher than it's been before in terms of collaboration on other health issues as well as virtual care. And then the final issue for patients as well as providers is digital health literacy, so education and literacy. Now, what can InfoAid do specifically? And so we're here now on a partnership program, and we're looking at the different partners that we work with from InfoAid. At InfoAid, we're an organization of only 160 people. We're not a health provider. We don't run a system. And so we really have to look at where we can make most, most impact with our resources. And in the end, the benefit of what we do is aimed at improving healthcare for patients and citizens and access to that. And also helping the hospitals, providers and health authorities come up with the solutions and provide the services in a seamless way. But the way that we really do that most effectively is first of all working with the federal government who have been our principal funder and the federal government are looking at national strategic directions they're looking at the efficiency of healthcare the quality of delivery but from a national perspective and then we work with the provinces and territories and really there's no one size fits all every province and territory has different issues there are a number of common areas that link them together but the emphasis may be different in different areas and again, healthcare costs and efficiency are very uh, top of mind, as well as how to accelerate these strategies, looking at best practice, looking at how we can look at areas like standards, interoperability, how we can scale and move forward. And then finally, but not last, we have industry. And when I look at industry, I also include the not-for-profit sectors and also the charitable sectors like organizations like Kid Help, Kids Help Phone. So how can we work with industry to bring solutions and services to the providers, the hospitals, the patients and citizens? And uh, I think our partnership with these organizations to, to engage in meetings like this, but also work on the common issues of procurement standards and so on, and relay the priorities that the provinces and territories have is a, a role that InfoAid can successfully play to help further develop the virtual care experience and the penetration of this technology. So what else are we doing? Well, following the kind of quick episode we had with our Rapid Response Fund, um, Health Canada also produced a new mandate, um, which was um, kind of heralded by the Prime Minister, 240 million investment in virtual care, 40 of that is going into mental health, and then the other 200 million is going to help the provinces and territories on a number of specific activities, and we have resources as well to kind of play a role in really orchestrating that and supporting the provinces and territories in their work based on a number of priorities that have come up in detailed discussions between ourselves, provinces, territories and health Canada. And uh, the technological focus that we're looking covers a number of areas, secure messaging, video conferencing, remote patient monitoring, access to test results, and then interoperability, integration, and, and so on. And these are all topics that were chosen by the provinces and the territories, and uh, that's where they want us to focus from a priority perspective. 
So now I know I'm coming up to the end of my presentation. This is the, the final slide. And so I wanted to touch on our other main program we have at Infoway. And you saw in a few slides ago, I was talking about the key use cases of virtual care. And the top two of those were prescription renewals and prescriptions. So after we've done that, we don't want to send a paper script to a pharmacy. We want to do it electronically. And I'm sure you're all aware of the initiative Prescribe It we've been working on for a few years. Uh, we now have actually 12 MOUs in place. I just signed one today with none of it. Uh, we're hoping to get um, BC on board. And we recently signed up Quebec. Um, we have great coverage from a prescriber point of view, which we're increasing, but also importantly from the pharmacy chains, we also have Shoppers Drug Mart and Lob Laws who have recently signed with us, and that complements Rexel, London Drugs, and uh, the majority of the high street chains across the country. And in addition to that, we've done a lot of work with the um, EMR providers to ensure we have a fully integrated solution. Um, we've seen a good increase in adoption during uh, the pandemic, and that's something we'll be focusing on going forward to bring more e-prescribing services uh, to citizens across the country. So that in a short presentation is the kind of focus that we have um, looking at the current pandemic. And I'm not sure if there's time for questions, but I'd be very happy to try and answer a couple. And thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. Michael, thank you so much for that update. Um, we don't have time for any questions this time, but a number of people have been asking for uh, your slides. So we wanna let people know that we're gonna have those available by the end of the week and we're gonna send those out. Uh, and you know, Michael, I was really interested to hear you mention, of course, uh, a couple of times I think you mentioned uh, uh, patient advocacy and do patients want it and are they asking for it? And I, th I think that's such a key piece of uh, any evolution uh, in, a, in a system like this. So thank you very much for uh, calling that out as well. Now we're gonna head into our first break. Uh, we're gonna have a poll running for you to check out. So please do take a minute uh, while you get your coffee or you, you take a, a health break. Um, make sure you take a minute to answer that poll that we're gonna throw up there on the screen as well. Uh, and we'll be, be getting restarted again in a couple of minutes. Thank you. Hey folks, welcome back. I hope you had enough time there to grab your coffee, take a quick break. We're gonna jump right into the next session. Uh, mental health and substance use, a panel. The issues are real, can interventions be virtual? Uh, today, we are going to welcome uh, Genevieve Sahalka, uh, Anne-Marie Churchill, Dr. David Gratzer, Catherine Hay. Hi, Kathy. Uh, and we're going to be facilitated by, uh, oh, I apologize, and Andrew Slater is in here as well. Don't want to forget, Andrew. Uh, we're going to be facilitated by Fraser Ratchford. Uh, we're going to get straight into the discussion here. So if you've not had a chance to check out all of these wonderful presenters biographies, head over to the platform and pull them up because we're going to jump into the panel now. Let's get them in here. Good afternoon, everyone. And Mark gave an excellent and compelling opening. And uh, Michael also alluded to it in his presentation as well. So mental health and substance use is an important issue. And it's important right now, um, not only because of the uh, pandemic, but also as we move forward and can virtual services actually solve our need? So we're gonna, as, as Mark said, we're gonna jump right into it. So I'm gonna pose uh, some questions. Please use the chat feature if you have some questions that you want uh, us to ask our panelists. Um, and uh, yeah. I'm going to start right off by asking Genevieve a question. And Genevieve, can you briefly talk about your ability to access services and the types of services you've accessed both during the pandemic and prior? Yes, um, prior to the pandemic, I accessed uh, mental health services privately and publicly. Through the public system, I found that there was quite substantial wait times uh, to access the anxiety disorders clinic through uh, one of the tertiary sites here in Winnipeg. It took a year and a half, and that was a year and a half after I had already done 
all the admissions screening to make sure I could indeed qualify for the services. So certainly lots of delays in accessing services and then lots of gatekeeping on the accessing of services in terms of um, jumping through hurdles to even qualify for them although I already had a physician referral. So I found that to be a bit confusing um, since I already had a diagnosis. Um, after the pandemic, some of my support systems that I already had in place in terms of mental health counseling were put on hold as I'm sure many other um, persons experience the same because nobody knew really how to deal with a pandemic and what to do. So things were paused and I sought out my own mental health support through uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association and they probably about a couple of months, maybe a month and a half into the pandemic shutdown had actually started offering online supports and those were an excellent way to still feel a sense of connection and a sense of community and address some really timely topics in terms of caring for self and mental health during the pandemic. Great, thank you. And now maybe if we uh, sort of extend on uh, Genevieve's experience, Kathy, could you maybe uh, talk about how youth are experiencing, uh, you know, what youth are experiencing right now? Yes, thanks so much, Fraser. And Genevieve, uh, it's courage like yours that ensure the conversation amplifies and that we all respond to that conversation, listening, learning, learning, and action. Um, I'd like to set the stage just a little bit, uh, if I may, on the Kids Help Phone front. I myself am not a clinician. I, rather, I'm driven by system solution and system change. Kids Help Phone is much more than the helpline one might remember on candy wrappers or on much music so many years ago, 30 years ago or more. We're actually, dare I say, pioneers in virtual care uh, and e-mental health solutions. Kids Help Phone right now is the only national bilingual 24-7 virtual care service for young people offering professional counseling anonymously, crisis response um, through uh, uh, confidentially and various other um, self-directed uh, information referrals and tools. We don't actually consider ourselves a youth charity using technology. Rather, we consider ourselves a technology innovation charity with a razor sharp focus on youth and mental health and e-health solutions. Um, we use AI, machine learning, uh, and data analytics. We're data driven. So we know what issues uh, are out there for young people. We know what they're worried about because we speak to them every single day. Last year, we supported young people 1.9 million times across Canada. And as of today uh, and counting for 2020, we have supported young people and people of all ages, actually 3.2 two million times so far this year. So Fraser, let me get to your question now. Uh, since March, when the pandemic started, uh, uh, our volumes went through the roof. Demand for our texting service up about 60%. Demand for professional counseling more than 55%. Year over year to now, uh, October to October, we're up on service volumes by more than 112%. So yes, COVID clearly has had an impact on mental health in this country. We've heard from young people, uh, we've experienced more contacts, conversations about eating and body image. As an example, one of the highest increases in conversations during COVID is that, as well as grief and loss, abuse of all kinds is up over 30% uh, in conversations, isolation and loneliness. Um, on top of this, if there, if we can put on top of this, uh, we deal with suicide ideation every single day, about 20% of our work, about 40% of our work is in depression, anxiety, and real mental health issues. So I say all of that because the barometer 
on mental health did not get reset because of COVID. We were in a crisis point in mental health prior to the pandemic. COVID-19 just overlays on top of all of that. So suffice it to say, at Kids Help Phone and with our partners uh, like yourselves all here, um, we're very concerned for our young people um, and data drives this concern. And I'll leave it at that for now. Great, thank you, Kathy. And, and uh, I, I think what is most intriguing is when you start talking about that data, your recent announcements of your insights platform really shows what youth are experiencing across the country. Uh, individuals can look at it. They don't have to feel alone because they can see others in their province or you know, nationally are experiencing something the same. So uh, kudos to you guys uh, for putting that up. I'm gonna switch the conversation over to uh, Anne-Marie and basically Anne-Marie, both what Genevieve and Kathy have described is not, uh, is not surprising. Um, and so as part of the consortium providing services to all Canadians, how is the Wellness Together portal supporting Canadians now? Thanks, Fraser. Um, it's great to be here. A real honor. Um, one of the things that we've noticed is the pandemic has really created an awareness of virtual care. And Wellness Together Canada, as a joint partnership with Kids Help Phone, Home with Health, and Step Care Solutions, um, is creating a totally virtual care service along a step care framework, supporting people across the country. Um, when we say a step care framework, what um, I mean by that is there's an array of care options and we can do all of this on a single portal. And these options can vary in intensity from low to high involvement. So people can choose. We find a lot of people go on and do what we call window shopping. They can browse. They can see what's available. Um, and these services can be also offered in very different ways. So different intensities, um, different mediums. People can get visual content. They can um, listen to audio recordings. Um, they can talk to a counselor by phone, by video. They can do text crisis through the kids' help phone. And through different modalities, people can choose to do things on their own. They can choose to have a group for support. Um, or they can choose to have one-to-one -one phone and video. The goal is really for people to have choice and control in their care. And so this whole portal allows us to create this environment where people get to learn more about mental health, learn what's available um, to help with their mental health and also to be able to make choices about that. So to actually see all of this on a portal such as Wellness Together Canada and to choose what they want to try at this point in time. And that can change. They can actually decide they try something simple, um, self-guided or they're reading about their mental health and then they learn more and then they become ready to engage in something like individual counseling or a very structured ICBT program. Um, so it really gives people the choice. Um, we think about Wellness Together Canada as both um, creating awareness of virtual care, but also choice um, in what's available. And so there's a live portal navigator from Home with Health, 24 hours if people land on the portal, they're not sure what they want, they can call this navigator who actually has been trained on the portal to tell them what's available, how to navigate around it. There's lots of mental health promotion and literacy. So one of the things we found out, almost 70% of people um, who've been using the portal say they're uncomfortable or unsure how to talk about their mental health with their networks. So what's wonderful is there's a whole array of promotion and literacy materials. Kids Help Phone have built out a Wellness Together Canada page with all kinds of resources related to these main issues with COVID. Um, and Home with Health have done the same thing on their side, created a whole page of, um, of mental health promotion and literacy on anxiety and resilience and stress, substance use. There's ongoing self-assessments of mood, well-being and functioning where people can tailor um, their own self-assessments, get email reminders to check in and be aware of their mental health and try to catch it if it, they are experiencing distress to actually catch it become, before it becomes more serious or self-guided programming. For people who want some support, they can do low intensity. They can do group coaching. They can do peer-to-peer -peer support or mindfulness classes. Um, and, and there's more um, substance use programming that just came on. Uh, which people can do self-guided or in a peer support group. And then, of course, the one-to-one -one professional counseling that Kids Help Phone are offering 
and Homewood Health. So there's a whole range of supports and services that provide options for people to find the right type of resource that works for them at any given time. Wow, uh, the, that's a lot of services, and uh, I, I want to thank you guys for uh, you know, making that available to Canadians. So that that is fantastic. Um, now we're going to switch gears and maybe go uh, to Andrew um, because we've had a very Canadian-centric um, sort of uh, thinking of uh, virtual mental health. And so, Andrew, I wonder if you could describe the types of virtual mental health and substance use services that are available in New Zealand. Yeah, kia ora koutou. Good, good morning, everyone. Well, evening, I think, for you. Um, so here in New Zealand, we've always had a, a ecosystem for about the last 10 years. We've had a national portal with a number of resources that's supported by a marketing and social marketing campaign. Um, and then we have the ability um, for sort of new and emerging providers to deliver online virtual counselling. There's a number of e-therapies that sit in the middle and, um, and online tools that to hang off that portal. Um, what we've seen with COVID-19 is the New Zealand health system. Uh, New Zealand's had a very different COVID experience. So um, we've seen, we added three e-therapies into that ecosystem um, specifically in response to COVID. Um, they got pushed out through a large social marketing campaign. Um, and then we also saw an, an edict and a switch in the health system that saw basically about 90% of appointments across primary care, primary mental health, switch to be delivered virtually over our what was called our level four lockdown of two months. So um, quite a dramatic change. I've, I've sort of, there's a lovely meme going around on the internet about who led the digital transformation of your company will replace that with health system. You know, was it the CEO, the minister, the CIO, or was it COVID-19? And I think certainly what we're seeing in New Zealand is greater integration between face-to-face -face services and virtual services and a new set of sort of um, endorsed and funded e-therapies. Right, thank you. Uh, so now let's get a clinician perspective. So David, I'm wondering if you could talk from your perspective, what are the barriers to providing mental health and substance use services virtually? And have previously real or perceived barriers been removed during the pandemic? Good questions. Uh, so I, I'm a psychiatrist. I, I see patients through the day. Uh, what an extraordinary transformation we've had in just such a short period of time. Um, telepsychiatry, telemental health, whatever term you want to use is something we did here at CAMH, the largest mental health hospital in the country, but we didn't do a lot of it. Uh, so in March, uh, February would be a better comparison, I suppose, but 300 patients were seen. Uh, that rose 800% over the course of the next 30 days. Uh, so we live in a different world. Uh, what are some of the, the, the benefits of this virtual care? I uh, think about a patient who is just discharged from hospital uh, and she, and I'll just blur some of the demographic details so she can't be identified, but she'd come off a manic episode and was doing really well. And she talked about wanting to return to work, but as you know, the highest risk of relapse off a manic episode is when a person has just been discharged from hospital. So I wanted to see her in her follow-up clinic. And she suggested to me she, she wanted to work and worried about taking an afternoon off, commuting downtown, trying to find parking in downtown Toronto. Uh, and then having to, to meet with me uh, and then commuting back, what would this mean to her work? In contrast, we were able to meet virtually. Uh, she booked off 20 minutes, didn't need permission from her boss. I don't think she even told her boss. She just took a, a late lunch. We were able to connect, but to do so in a way that, that didn't disrupt her work. So incredible convenience from the point of view of patients, as we've heard others comment on today, incredible convenience also in terms of bridging geographic barriers. So I'm in downtown Toronto, there are a lot of hospitals here, but two hours north of North Bay, there aren't so many hospitals perhaps, but now we're able to reach people much better. But to go back to your core question, I mean, what should we be concerned about? What are some of the barriers? Let's remember that some 28 million North Americans 
don't have access to reliable broadband. So when we talk about people being able to access an app or people being able to, to have a televideo session with somebody like myself, uh, who's a clinician, that doesn't cover everyone in every circumstance. In fact, tens of millions of people across North America are locked out. I would also say that some people lack knowledge. Uh, so if you look at somebody like, well, like my older daughter, it seems everything can be done on a, a, an iPhone and, and more. Um, if you look at people who are older, such as my parents, they just naturally know less uh, about technology. So I think we need to be very cautious not to have a one-size-fits-all approach. And so for that patient who returned to the workforce, who's pretty internet savvy and pretty comfortable, that's an option for care, absolutely. But we need to be concerned that not everyone has access to that technology or is able to use that technology, or frankly, feels comfortable with that technology. So the pendulum has swung from one extreme to another, um, maybe a little bit too much has swung onto one side, at least for, for certain patients I take care of. Right. Thank you for that. And thank you for identifying that the issue of bandwidth. Um, certainly Genevieve's experiencing that as we speak. And uh, she lives in, uh, um, in, in a rural part of Manitoba, which, you know, we may have some connectivity problems, but we're dealing with that. Um, so uh, bandwidth is an issue. Um, and Anne-Marie, actually, one of our audience participants did ask the question about, uh, for Wellness Together, how are you approaching rural and First Nation services given the bandwidth uh, limitations. And maybe I'll also give you the floor because um, you're a clinician yourself to talk about other barriers that could be perceived. Yeah, thanks for that. Actually, I, I can talk about the bandwidth first. And that is a recognized issue. As a matter of fact, I had it on my list of barriers. Um, as a clinician, there are some people um, who definitely communities um, that are limited by the bandwidth. We're actually working and have contacts in a number of rural and remote areas, indigenous communities, and working with them to find some solutions to that. So for some of it, there's, of course, the low tech. So that's great that we with both home with health and kids help phone. Um, a phone um, is what people can use. And with some of our third party vendors like Strongest Families, that work is done over the phone. Um, some of the more high tech programs that take a lot of bandwidth, those are a real issue. And I think we all need to be advocating for the equity issues and equality issues around bandwidth. Um, so for the Wellness Together Canada, that's one of the reasons why we decided from the beginning that we had to have a wide array array of services. Um, so if we have some really high tech programming, we also need some low tech programming and some programming that um, that people can access in different ways. So we recognize that that is one of the barriers. And as a clinician, um, some of the barriers, so certainly that tech and digital, and to David's point, it's not just around the connectivity, it's also around people's um, familiarity with technology. My own parents in their 80s, my father had a stroke through COVID um, and back and forth the hospital and trying to get my mother how to use an iPad. And she just said to me recently, he's now um, getting care and rehab. And we went to visit him yesterday with the iPad. And she's 88 and she's using the iPad and showing him pictures. So it took about two months of a lot of coaching. Um, so I think that the awareness and the support around tech is going to be really, really important so that people do get access. The other thing that we're noticing, and I think from a clinical perspective, and I see this both from my fellow colleagues who provide services, but also the general public, is the perception that digital isn't as good or virtual care isn't as good or the real thing is the one-to-one -one, um, counseling or therapy. And as we know, many people don't engage in that. And I think we've missed people for a long time because that was the type of care and it was one size fits all. So I think that we have a long way to go to shift the perception that different types of care and different types of services work for different people. And we like to say that gold standard is what fits. So it's not one type. It's what really works for people. But I think that perception piece is huge. The other one that I'll just mention, because we're working really hard on this at Wellness together Canada, it hit me having been a clinician for almost 
25 years is one of the first things when you do when someone walks in the door is make that connection and get buy-in and engagement. And we've just found that very, very difficult to do in a virtual care site if you already know the person. But for people coming to the site, how do you make it kind? How do you make it compassion, compassionate and empathic and engaging? Um, and we've we've met with different groups to have some ideas around that. But we're, we really find that the idea that um, people can come and feel comfortable and finding ways to do that. It's not enough just to offer the service. It's how to help people actualize their intent when they come. So if they really want to get help, helping them to get the help. And I think we need some real development in that um, engagement, or we call it the UI UX piece of virtual care. Right. And, and that's actually a nice segue because Genevieve, on the topic of barriers for those who are seeking care, what factors um, encourage and or inhibit individuals from virtual options? And what do you want care providers to know? I think um, what helps enhance uh, access to care is certainly your links to the patient being knowledgeable. Uh, primary care physicians are definitely a piece that have to be targeted and targeted quite aggressively as to what services are available. To be honest, I've educated my primary care provider on that. So now she knows some different things that she can recommend other patients access. In terms of um, uh, additional barriers, Anne brought up a really good point about not a one size fits all. I have other friends who have struggled with mental health challenges as well, and for them, they don't actually like the online piece. For them, they feel that they really need to be in the presence of somebody because that's what connects best for them. Uh, the other piece that I think I've noticed is a very clear gap, and Emily touched on it a little bit, is that service providers who are using online resources don't have the knowledge on how to communicate effective body language online. That to me I see as a huge gap. You know, 90, what is it, 93% of our communication is body language, 7% is verbal. Well, now you've just created a giant gap and service providers actually do not know how to utilize these technologies to convey stuff and some of it gets lost in translation when you think about overcoming stigma um discussing very sensitive topics um putting your vulnerabilities and your challenges all the way out there there are so many nuances that can be missed and can inadvertently shut down transparency and communication, which would be very uh, valuable for the service provider to know. So I think as we go forward, there needs to be more research also on that piece, how service providers can best utilize um, their body language in a virtual or delayed setting, you know, even that bandwidth issue that I have a challenge with in my real setting. How do we still facilitate openness and communication and how do they also notice the subtleties of the body language of the client themselves uh, i have a feeling we could spend all afternoon just talking on that very subject Genevieve. but a uh, very good point you raised um, and especially if we think of some of the interventions i know kids help phone uses texting so you know body language there could be emojis and things like that but uh, actually speaking of kids help phone um, Kathy, we know uh, youth have been particularly impacted during the pandemic and Kids Help Phone ramped up services to meet the demand. So thinking about others who may need to ramp up services, what advice do you have for other organizations considering virtual options? 
Wow, you give me the opportunity to pontificate, Fraser. Thank you. Um, I, oh, oh um, Chatty Kathy. Uh, I do want to put one other barrier in the mix here from our conversation is that's cost to the end user, uh, the service user, not just cost to the healthcare system. So it's really important for virtual care to stand up with uh, no bandwidth or no data or data costs. Um, uh, that could be a huge barrier for youth and coming into COVID economy and uncertainty. So um, uh, what advice would I have? Well, first of all, uh, just the basic steady state is not an option. Um, none of us in healthcare or mental health care or virtual system care uh, should opt out of virtual care. It should be an additional piece of uh, a normal course of action, actually. Um, and here's my pontification. The healthcare system, as we know it, is not really sustainable in present form. Uh, and virtual care is actually part of, uh, part of the solution. Um, I don't believe we need a gazillion more dollars. Sure, we need more dollars, but we don't need a gazillion more. Rather, what we need to do is redeploy those dollars differently, and virtual care is a piece of the redeployment. Um, and when you do that, you enable tertiary care, primary care, hospitals, ERs, to do the job that they need to do. And communities and people, um, like each of us, um, we have our own health care in our own hands that way, in our own mental health care, and in the communities, um, uh, to uh, David's point, uh, not everybody can commute. So um, the other thing to note is virtual care may be the only door open for remote or underserved populations, and the world is digital. So my advice um, is put the service user, the patient, the client in the center um, of all your decision making at the table. In fact, invite them to the table. It is very true. Nothing for youth without youth, nothing for Indigenous youth or Black youth without uh, Black youth or Indigenous youth at the table. It's a guiding principle for Kids Help Phone. And I already told you about our volume increase uh, since COVID. Here's the startling fact about uh, Kids Help Phone. We could not have responded to COVID as we had or have if we had not already innovated and amplified our virtual care platforms and services uh, because steady state from the past would have shut us down or overwhelmed us. That's a fact. And so the big overarching thing as you innovate with virtual care that Kids Help Phone um, sought out and got the benefit of is build partnerships. Um, Canada Health InfoA is the best example of a great partnership to stand up services that will be there in times of crisis, reduced barriers, re, um, getting rid of silos. So that's my big pontificating advice is partnership, put, uh, put the people we care about at the center of the discussion at the table. Um, because if we don't do that, the tragedy of it all would be that people in Canada um, who need e-health solutions, e-mental health solutions, and don't get it, um, well, it's actually life-saving. Uh, it's actually not an option. So thanks for a great question. And the platform, Fraser. Uh, thanks for pontificating. So um, I'm going to now um, ask Andrew another question and uh, would, would love to hear your insights, Andrew. So how has COVID-19 changed the future of virtual services over the next five years? Yeah, look, this is the, the opinion of myself. But I think what we're going to see is e-health had always kind of been sitting off out on the side. And what we're seeing now is the mainstream system is adopting it. Um, I have some concerns about that. I think we've got to be really careful, careful about dangerous enthusiasm. Certainly in this part of the world, we've seen harm from e-therapies and virtual services, particularly where they're not integrated with, with a patient's face-to-face -face care. So I actually think um, we're going to see it exponentially increase. We're going to see exponential adoption. 
Um, I know here in New Zealand, we're doing a lot of work around um, co-design for equity, around reducing barriers, making sure that whilst a website might look amazing, if it's going to cost dollars for somebody to engage with, we're actually better off to tone down the design. Um, I think the biggest challenge for the system is how do we retrofit every clinician in our system to virtualize their clinical practice? So, um, you know, we talk emojis, we talk, um, we talk everything. I always say virtual care is a bit like you're removing a number of the senses um, and asking a clinician, for example, my nurses in Healthline, um, I'm asking them to do a ward round blind without the ability to touch, um, smell, all they can do is hear. And so we actually need to work with our tertiary institutions, work with our provider communities to make sure that we systematically virtualize everyone's clinical craft to work well over those technologies. I, I don't necessarily think, I think for a period pre-COVID, we were heading into a world of a parallel health system, a virtual health system, um, and then we'd probably spend billions of dollars integrating it with primary, secondary, tertiary and primary care. Um, whereas I think now what we're going to see is see um, digital technology, virtual health, virtualize and support the creation of capacity, customer choice, um, and, and hopefully better clinical outcomes in the existing health system and domains, which I think is really exciting. It is exciting. And that, so, David, maybe I'll ask you, um, are you aware of current research that is showing promise uh, in the virtual mental health and substance use services? Well, we have decades of research that has been promising uh, and it suggested things like patients are very comfortable with televideo when it comes to, to mental health care. Uh, in fact, the first studies were, were, were published uh, in the 1950s on this topic. Uh, people are able to connect with their provider in, in, in most circumstances, not just virtually, but I meant uh, um, uh, in terms of a, a doctor, patient, or clinician, patient uh, context. But I also suggest that that is where we could do the most in terms of research. Let me give you one example. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has come up a couple of times today. As you know, that's a, an evidence-based therapy. It tends to be short, very focused. For people with mood and anxiety problems, there's evidence that cognitive behavioral therapy works as well as pills. Some research suggests maybe there's a synergistic effect, which is a fancy way of saying that if you have a major depressive episode, taking medications in combination with cognitive behavioral therapy is better than just taking medications alone. We know that internet delivered cognitive behavioral therapy can also be very effective and there's good work done in Sweden, in the UK and in North America. Um, but we don't exactly know who benefits most from these sorts of therapies. So we know that many people respond, but imagine if driven by big data and, and clinical outcomes, we could customize these tools more. So a young woman comes to her emergency department on a sunny afternoon like today with a history of major depressive disorder and panic attacks, and we know demographically and driven by clinical outcomes, she would do better with this tool than, say, an older gentleman who had less in way of anxiety and more in way of depressive symptoms, and he should get in person cognitive behavioral therapy. So I think really the challenge in the next little while is not just to have the tools and fine tune them. And again, that speaks to some issues we've already spoken to like equity and, and access and so on, but trying to figure out for, uh, you know, for who we should target these tools and who actually shouldn't do these sorts of interventions and should do more of a traditional in-person intervention. So Research-wise, we've done work, but I think the next stage of research and what's really compelling is to, to, to fine-tune what we're doing and, and to have ultimately a, a patient experience that is customized and most clinically relevant because at the end of the day, forget the studies, we want people to get better and get back to life. Great. Uh, thank you for that response. Uh, a question that we've had come in from the audience is around, uh, so David, you started talking off that, you know, most people have accepted the kind of video uh, intervention. Um, so I'm throwing this open to whoever would like to um, uh, answer is, can asynchronous virtual visits um, be effective? Um, I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear it from our panelists. Uh, 
Kathy, Anne Marie, David, uh, any any thoughts on that uh, question? Not for, uh, kids cell phone doesn't do video right now, though it is something that we are exploring for for the coming months. It, right, and uh, and here in here in New Zealand, we um, we offer video in some services, but um, for every one video session that I can hold, I can hold two phone calls um, because of cost and and there's a whole pile of other connectivity issues. We do let um, people send us images though. Um, one way upload, um, which is quite effective. What I was trying yeah, I to. I was going to say, I, sorry, Fraser, I was just going to say, yeah, asynchronous. I mean, we can use that certainly um, to reinforce what people are doing for people to revisit. You know, we especially talk with CBT with home activities and practice. So I do think there's a role for that for sure. Okay. I, I, I might jump in here and say, look, uh, it depends what the problem is and depends where people are in their journey. So to, to pick up on points others have made, uh, you know, we, we ought to have a, a stepped care approach to mental health problems. So some people uh, are very stressed out and they're actually extremely high functioning. They have no genetic loading for major mental illness and they, in a sense, need some help, uh, but not necessarily that direct. So some resources and encouragement may be uh, something they could do online with an encouraging email email or to speak to your point, asynchronous technology. On the other hand, if you've got a, a first responder with 20 years experience and very refractory PTSD, I don't think he will respond well to the occasional email. So again, you know, fine tuning these tools and thinking about what exactly the problem set is, I think that's going to be the key to the future. Right. Okay, we're, we're about to wrap up. So I'm going to give you each uh, like a 30 second or even maybe less just a uh, thought on if you could answer, um, is virtual here to stay? Um, so uh, Andrew, let's start with you. Um, yes. <laughs> that, 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 that's in the time zone. Okay, Kathy, what about your feelings on this? Uh, emphatic, yes, indeed, has to. Steady state's not an option. Okay, David? Yes, but. <laughs> yes, but not for everyone in every circumstance. And yes, but we need to work on, on, on making this work well, including addressing issues around equity and fairness. Right, Anne-Marie? And I would say absolutely, it, it provides additional options and choice for people um, and allows people more control and empowerment over their care. Excellent. Last word to you, Genevieve. Yes, I really do hope it's here to stay. I think with where we're going in terms of healthcare, this definitely will be here. And I echo the concerns around studying it further and understanding what is um, definitely a pretty big tool in the tool belt, but not the only approach. So I'm excited about staying. Right, right. Well, I'd like to thank all of you. So thank you very much. It was an excellent discussion and we, we didn't have a chance to get all to all of the questions uh, that were posed uh, by our audience out there. So we'll have to uh, maybe ping some of you to uh, help us uh, answer some of those and follow up. Um, we're going to have one more poll running um, that you can check out. And then also uh, it's time for another break. So grab a drink or, you know, whatever you need to, uh, to sustain yourself. And Mark will get us restarted in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Timothy Foggin, and I'm the Canadian Medical Director of Teladoc Health. With our company mission being to transform how people access and experience healthcare around the world, it's my greatest pleasure to introduce you to today's keynote speaker, Dr. Wangari, who will be speaking about Kenya's key advancements in mobile health technology. Dr. Wangari is the Senior Health Advisor at the Presidential Policy and Strategy Unit in the Executive Office of the President, Republic of Kenya, in this role, Dr. Wangari is the lead interlocutor on universal health coverage, one of the pillars of the Big Four agenda, which is His Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta's plan for socioeconomic transformation. Her focus areas include ensuring that sufficient technical grounding is applied to all health-related priorities of the President's office and that the technical implications of the same are coordinated with and through the Ministry of Health, 
and all this while remaining cognizant of the political and economic dynamics within and without the health sector. Dr. Wangari holds a master's degree in health policy, planning and financing from the London School of Economics and Political Science, as well as a degree from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She also has a medical degree from the University of Nairobi. Prior to her current role, Dr. Wangari worked in both leadership and service delivery roles in both urban and rural Kenya in both public and private health facilities. Please do join me now in welcoming Dr. Wangari. Thank you. Good afternoon, um, Canada. Good evening to colleagues who are joining me uh, here from Kenya and good morning to Andrew in New Zealand. Um, my name is Dr. Wangari Nganga. I work in the president's office here in Kenya. I am a senior health advisor. I spend a lot of my time working on the universal health coverage program, which is one of four transformation pillars of President Kenyatta's second term. Um, but I have also been working a lot on the COVID pandemic, as has probably everyone in the health sector in the world. Um, a little bit of my own background. So I'm a medical doctor by training. I trained here in the University of Nairobi in Kenya. Um, I then worked in a combina combination of public and private hospitals, uh, mainly in rural Kenya for about five years. I then uh, branched out of mainstream medicine and pursued a uh, master's in health policy planning and financing in London, uh, after which I returned and I'm fully now in the policy space. Um, so as I said, I work um, a lot thinking through about how to ensure universal health coverage. Uh, at the moment, Kenya is pursuing this uh, through progressive expansion of uh, public health insurance for all Kenyans. Uh, knowing that there's probably some of our audience who don't know Kenya that well, I'm made to understand by some of the folks at Health InfoWay that this is one of the first times that you're having someone uh, probably not from Europe or from the Americas. I'll start by introducing uh, Kenya is uh, off the east coast of Africa. Um, we are a country primarily English speaking, 50 million Kenyans. Uh, Half of that, about 25 million of us are under 19, 75% uh, of that is under um, 35. Um, so yeah, we are a bunch of children and uh, I am excited for this because uh, the future is truly ours. Um, so we are a low and middle income country with a GDP of around 87 billion US dollars, uh, per capita GDP uh, of around 1,900 uh, USD. Uh, I, I say that, but you, as you may imagine, there's quite some disparity. Um, so, you know, not everyone gets to see that in their bank at the end of the year. Um, specifically in terms of health, we are a country that's still battling with infectious diseases, malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis still account for for majority of uh, mortality amongst adults and children, mm -hmm. uh, but especially amongst adults, uh, increasingly deaths related to non-communicable diseases are now visible. Um, complications related to diabetes and hypertension, and road traffic accidents, and actually mental health related um, deaths. Um, in terms of health spending, uh, we spend around 450 million US dollars a year. Um, as a whole, and that proportion is about 40% from the government of Kenya. That's a combination of, uh, I think, what you call in Canada, federal and provinces. We call it here central government and counties. Um, so a combination of that about make about 40%, around 25% um, is from development partners, multilateral, bilateral, and the rest is unfortunately from uh, people's pockets. So as you can imagine, very many families um, spend what we call catastrophic health expenditure, which is about 40% of their non-food budget. And about a million households are pushed into poverty every year for spending for healthcare. Um, you know, with those very fairly grim statistics, uh, we are known uh, generally in the world for our digital and tech space. Um, Kenya is more famously known for um, a mobile money platform known as M-Pesa. Um, basically, it is the country's bank. Um, I was just 
checking up the statistics today because I haven't checked up in a while. And um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the president gave directions that we should reduce cash transactions. And um, in response, the mobile money platforms were asked to increase the amount of money one can send out and or receive per day uh, from a maximum of about $1,400 upwards to about $3,000. And as a result, uh, between the first quarter of this year and the second quarter, uh, person-to-person transactions move from a U.S. dollar 674 million up to 722 million. So that's just about a hundred million dollars, and I mean U.S. dollars more uh, person-to-person transactions. Uh, business-to-business transactions move from 878 USD uh, to almost a billion dollars. So a lot of money moves uh, on this platform. Um, basically introduced in early 2007 and disrupted the banking sector, allows uh, one person to send to another person money on a mobile platform. This has expanded to uh, the banking sector, government sector, basically everywhere. Uh, And coming out of the digital systems in Kenya, I'm going to segue into my presentation uh, where I'm going to focus on the strides Kenya has made in mobile health technologies uh, uh, having given the current context, if you could move to the next slide, please. Uh, ha- having given the current health context in Kenya, um, you know, in the ICT space, just as I've said, um, a lot of money moves on the mobile money platform, but we measure something we call access to SIM cards. It's a tiny little, little card you get from your mobile service provider that you put in your phone as opposed to access to the mobile phone itself, because you can own a SIM card and borrow a phone and put it in. So if you measure access to mobile SIM cards, we actually at 120% of the population. So as I said, we are about 48 million, according to our census last year, and we have 57 million SIM cards. So yes, people can own more than one SIM card, uh, but people also own SIM cards and don't own phones. So mobile ownership, is a little bit lower, but you know I've just tried to give you an explanation of why. Um, also, during the period from around 2002 leading up to now, government has made uh, increasing amounts of investments in infrastructure in the IT space, and specifically in health. Um, the Ministry of Health has uh, developed M Health standards and guidelines, and actually this is gazetted in the Kenya Health Act 2017. So because of such widespread access, um, I I could bet that the cost of my internet connection is most likely lower than yours. It's definitely amongst the lowest in the continent uh, and increasingly lower and lower in the world. Uh, If we can move on to the next. So I'm just going to walk you through a few examples of how we've used mobile health. And I have singled out mobile health interventions or applications as opposed to internet ones is the access to internet connectivity does not compare with access to mobile phones majority of kenyans own um uh basic feature phones as opposed to smartphones uh so therefore i focus my presentation on mobile health solutions and i'll just walk through um each of them giving you examples of what the country is doing and i'll start with uh, health insurance which is on the next slide. Yes, yeah, so um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a background. I'm sure the slides will be shared with you. So the link at the bottom of that screen is actually a live link and you can read more about um, this particular application. Uh, I picked this one as an example, but there are several others. Um, this is uh, done by a CSO um, in organization here in Kenya known as AMREF, and I'm sure there's an AMREF Canada in case they are dialed in. Um, but AMREF, uh, in partnership with several county governments, have gone out of their way to increase access to public health insurance here in Kenya. So that's offered by um, National Hospital Insurance Fund. Um, that's the oldest, actually, we are very proud of that, the oldest health insurer in Africa, started in 1966, of course, started as um, health insurance just for public servants, but 
over the years has expanded to um, accommodate up to 9 million Kenyans. So that's just about 20% coverage. So noting that stagnation, um, come, uh, institutions such as AMREF, Farm Access, Living Goods, and others have come up with platforms such as this to allow registration to basically happen at the household. As you can see, this lady is literally by her household um, with her family behind her, uh, a photograph that's usually required for registration into um, NHIF is, is, is possible to be taken with a smartphone. Um, so the method that AMREF in particular have used and several of the others that I've mentioned is through community health workers who are volunteers from within the community. So the communities trust them, who go around door to door registering those who are not um, registered for NHIF. So they take the photograph and the same application has an inbuilt mobile wallet. So the cost of health insurance is about US dollars five per month. So that comes about 6,000 shillings um, a year, which is about $60. Um, may not sound like much, but it's uh, quite a lot when you have more than 36% of the country living under $1.9 a day. So $60 a year is um, unreachable for majority of Kenyans. So what happens is that this platform allows you to literally save $2 a day, if that's what you can afford, um, excuse me, 20 cents a day, uh, if that's what you can afford, which cumulatively in a month will make um, the $5 you need um, to pay for your monthly premiums. So I guess our important caveat there is that uh, health insurance in this country is voluntary for people in the informal sector, and it's mandatory for people in the formal sector. Those in the informal sector make up 80% of the labor workforce. So um, as you can hear, majority of Kenyans would access then health insurance in a voluntary manner, which means high attrition and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, th I think that kind of describes that platform. As I said, this is an example of several others, and that's a live link there. You can ask, uh, follow to um, read more about this particular uh, application. If we can move on to the next one. Yeah, so we are also increasingly using mobile phones to capture health and medical records. I've given you, again, uh, links there to various examples of how we are doing this. Um, so the one I'd like to talk about, I know that's not the one on the screen, but the one I'd really like to talk about, which is um, through the link, I've got 99 problems, but a phone ain't one of them. Uh, is an interesting development uh, by a friend of mine who works in the Strathmore Business School here in Nairobi that allows a rubber stamp um, to be converted into elect uh, an, an electronic medical record uh, with a camera of a basic um, smartphone. And one, this uh, allows you to basically create electronic medical records uh, instantaneously but can also be used in uh, improving clinical documentation um, in terms of ensuring that all the important fields are captured as opposed to a blank sheet, which is what most of us find when you go to the hospital to see a patient. Uh, and lastly, improving clinical outcomes if you incentivize, uh, so excuse me, so if you use the rubber stamp to kind of um, document a clinical pathway. So lots and lots of tools here, including some used by uh, mainstream government organizations. Uh, so KEMSA, which is the fourth URL down there, is the Kenya Medical Supplies um, Authority. It is basically like a central medical stores, and they use um, LMIS systems to kind of track um, delivery of medicines and medical commodities from the central stores uh, right to the um, health facility. So we are now working on how we can track medical supplies and medicines from the health facility to the patient, uh, because that should be the target. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on to the next and allow you guys to read. Um, quality of care. Um, let's get into some COVID talk now. Um, so 
20, 12th of March was uh, the date we first recorded the COVID case here in Kenya. And following that, a series of interventions were announced by His Excellency the President and the Ministry of Health, which included quarantine measures, uh, institutionalized quarantine, if I may add, uh, especially at the beginning of a pandemic. So any um, planes coming into the country before we shut down the airports had to, uh, anybody arriving into the country had to be in um uh, quarantined uh, in designated institutions. Anybody testing positive for COVID at the time also had to be isolated in designated institutions, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic. Uh, of importance to note here is about 90, 92% of cases diagnosed uh, in Kenya so far have been asymptomatic. Um, so quickly, um, you know, two to three months into the pandemic, the, we recognized that this was probably not the best way to handle a pandemic that is um, in the, to, well, to use the resources that are constrained in the health system um, in a pandemic that's rapidly evolving. So for those who are asymptomatic and fit certain criteria as prescribed by the Ministry of Health, could quarantine at home. But how do we know what's going on at home? And so M Health Kenya come up with this app, which we call Jitenge, which is a very crude translation for isolation, uh, or, you know, keep to yourself, um, that allows you to track what's going on with the patient and the patient can basically self-report. So what's happening in terms of your symptoms and you get an SMS reminder um, every two hours in case you forget to fill in um, your symptoms. So uh, do you have a fever? Are you coughing? Are you struggling to breathe? Um, so that that's one example of many, many other quality of care tools um, that are out there via mobile platforms. I'll move on to the next one, which is access to clinical and pharmaceutical services. So here I give you three examples. Uh, my DAWA is um, maybe two to three years old now, uh, is an online uh, company that allows access to pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals, uh, whether prescription or non-prescription. Uh, and basically allows delivery service. So this was new, um, you know, when it started. There are quite a few others now. Triggerize, which is the one in the middle, uh, offers adolescent girls a platform to share their experience uh, around accessing uh, reproductive health services. So, you know, which provider did you go to? Did he explain or she explain what you needed to know? Um, were you treated a, in a in a respectable manner? There's uh, mixed feelings around um, access to reproductive health services, um, especially contraception for adolescent girls. And so there's a lot of efforts from government to ensure that this is done um, in a manner that uh, allows girls the freedom that they need, but respects um, the cultural and the religious context in which we live in. The last example uh, on the extreme right is Daktari Africa, which is, uh, I would say, the conventional telemedicine platforms um, that, that, that probably are known around the world. You know, there's a screen and your doctor is on the other end and you can have a conversation about how you're feeling. Um, what we've enjoyed about this particular one is that they've gone out of their way to move out of the cities and start having um, these interactions in more rural areas. So the picture I'm showing on the right is actually a hospital in rural Muranga. So that's about 150 to 200 kilometers away from Nairobi. And you can use a platform either for continuous medical education for the providers or literally to offer a consult. Um, so Daktari Africa report after a year of service in one of the rural hospitals in Moranga that their patients actually had better clinical outcomes. So they focused on hypertension and diabetes, so better control sugar, better control hypertension um, and such like. So their next phase right now is to try and get accredited by the National Health in uh, Hospital Insurance Fund. So that's our public health insurer as an outpatient um, stroke primary care provider. And accreditation therefore means um, anybody who has access to the card uh, will then have their fees paid and they don't have to pay out of pocket. Um, I'll move on to the next section. 
And I'll give you a talk through, um, uh, through this case study, which I was actually quite central to. So COVID-19 comes and uh, nobody knows uh, what's going on except what we are receiving from the countries uh, that were a little bit ahead of uh, us in, the in terms of the pandemic. So that's China. We were all looking at China. I remember by the time we got our first case was the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in Italy. Um, and so that's kind of what we knew that, you know, people get really sick and then you're kind of supposed to lock down and all that kind of thing. But really sick was um, what meant what? So, you know, in the initial phases, we were all looking for cough. We were all looking for fever and we didn't have information and we needed to share some level of information with the public. So we approach the largest mobile uh, provider in Kenya. So that is Safaricom. Safaricom has, of the 57 million SIM cards I told you um, about earlier, about 35 million belong to Safaricom. So they have a huge call center, as you would imagine, for uh, support services for their customers. But we approach them uh, through the Ministry of Health and asked if they could set up a toll-free number that could be used across the networks where the public could dial in and get information around COVID-19. So it's a combined platform um, that's basically an interactive voice recording leading up all the way to talking to a real customer agent. So it started out as an information platform. Um, I visited the call center and quickly realized that increasingly there was a growing demand on the call center agents to perform some sort of screening. So patients would call in and say, okay, um, I'm coughing, but I've actually been coughing for the last three months. I didn't start coughing two weeks ago when you recorded the first case. So when you live um, this side of the Sahara, as we say, cough for more than two weeks is equals uh, tuberculosis unless I prove otherwise. So what would happen would the, with the call center agents, because they are not uh, trained health workers, if, if the, if the um, presenting complaints, if I may call them that, were not as prescribed in the sheet we gave them, in the information sheet we gave them, then it became, okay, so you don't have COVID, so hang up. Right. So quickly, the question became, so is it OK if you're coughing with TB? I leave you alone, but you can as long as it's not COVID, I don't care. And this just goes to show you that we don't have um, a 911 as you know, an emergency response line in that manner that's publicly known and that's publicly accessed. So this kind of grew into that. It filled a gap that we didn't know existed. We had. Um, uh, women calling in in labor. Um, remember, this was a time we had instituted a nationwide curfew. The curfew is still on. The hours have just changed. But the curfew at that time started at 7 p.m. So for those on the call who are health workers, uh, for some reasons, babies choose to come at night. I, I don't know what the magic is there. But if they are going to come at night and there's a curfew, a nationwide curfew, which means there's no public transport, which means there are no taxis, uh, and it's unlikely that you can walk to the health center. So how are you supposed to get um, access to uh, skilled birth attendants? So uh, as the calls at the call center uh, became uh, more medical, uh, so to speak, uh, we together, myself together, under the instructions of the Principal Secretary of the Ministry of Health, put together a team of medical doctors, uh, 50 of them, and we embedded this in the call center uh, of Safaricom. And so, you know, we had a quick three-day training uh, with them for COVID-19 symptoms, uh, at least so what we knew at the time, but the instructions were clear. The person who calls you has a problem which you need to address in some shape, way or form, you can't just hang up because it doesn't sound like COVID. So this, so basically what would happen is that you would call in and if you get to the first uh, call center agent who is not a trained medic and you asked a question that needed escalation, so it was escalated to the medical doctors who then called in the rapid response team if you had symptoms that sounded like COVID and you needed evacuation, 
or who call the rapid response team if you needed ambulatory services because you were pregnant and in labor. Um, and then the third layer we later developed was actually linkage to a different call center, which had standby psychologists and psychiatrists, because we then realized a lot of people were calling in um, mainly anxious. So I don't know if this cough I've had today or today, you know, the temperature is a little bit hotter, so I feel fever. I don't know if that's COVID. And, you know, what we were seeing, as I said, at the time was Italy and then Spain before it came over west or, you know, further west. Um, and that was quite anxiety inducing. What do I do? So both for the patients, uh, but also especially for the health workers. So this is a time where we didn't have uh, enough PPE. We didn't have enough testing. Um, and you really don't know. You just don't know. Um, you don't know what to do with a patient in front of you who has uh, a cough or who has symptoms that are congruent with COVID-19. And, you, you know, the test result will only come back three days later. So the 1199, that's the number for the uh, psychology call center, was quite useful both for health workers and for uh, the general public who needed um, some sort of reassurance to talk to someone through what they were going uh, about what they were going through during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and if we can just move on to the next slide, it shows you the statistics of um, what at the height of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, the response was up to 2 million people interacting with an interactive voice recording system. So, you know, that means either you just prompted for information or you went all the way through to the call center. Um, there were more than 20,000 daily inquiries to the customer service, uh, service agents. Uh, there were 300 service agents uh, donated by Safaricom and there were, number, uh, there were 50 uh, doctors on call. Uh, I think I've described this, and that link is also live if you'd like to read more about this. Uh, but I'd specifically like to say that we are really thinking about how to transition this. So the call center hits have drastically reduced. This we set up in April 2020. We are now in October. And I think the report I saw this morning showed maybe 600 calls today um, that were specific to COVID. Um, the overwhelming um, response to the call center at the beginning clearly showed a gap for an emergency response number, somewhere where, that I, where I can either get information or help before I get to the health center. And so we are currently in discussions with the National Hospital Insurance Fund to see if this number could be transferred to them uh, as a number where the general public can, you know, the basic description would be our 911. Um, knowing that, you know, we've kind of have an infrastructure set up, a thinking around it, uh, could this be something that they carry forward so that we, we don't lose? And how do we link this to ambulatory care as well? Um, so I'm going to spend the next five minutes just talking through uh, some challenges in the M Health space. If we can move to the next slide. Um, some challenges we've gone through and some parting shots about what we can consider as we move forward for a country like Kenya. Um, so a lot of questions around sustainability, open source technologies, financial requirements, um, and understanding the local context. So a lot of requests have come in, especially in the COVID time, and someone will come to me and say, oh, this worked in Rwanda, so it should work in Kenya, or this worked in somewhere else, and so it should work. Um, as you probably experience within Canada itself must be quite heterogeneic, heterogeneic between, you know, between provinces, probably even within provinces because of how vast they are, uh, definitely within provinces and territories and such like or between Canada and the US, uh, where someone else would say they are both North America. Uh, the same heterogeneity applies. Uh, I would not even dream that one mobile health technology that worked for our neighbors here in Uganda would work for us here in Kenya. Uh, or even within the country, the disparateness may not allow a one size fits all. 
and so one needs to be quite careful about what you uh, are putting in place. Do you understand the needs of your users, the social dynamics, uh, and whatnot? Um, as I conclude, I just want to point out a few parting shots. Um, I kind of changed my mind about what was on the slide, but I'll have a slide anyway. <laughs> I'll summarize it differently. Um, so one is this thing we call the digital divide. Uh, inequity is quite perverse uh, with or without the digital tools. And in some uh, instances is actually making the uh, divide greater. So one of my colleagues is actually working on an adolescence study, uh, following up on adolescence during this COVID-19 pandemic. One of the interesting findings is that adolescent boys will have access to their parents' phone when the parent comes home, but not as much adolescent girls. So if our primary method of delivery is a mobile phone, there's a clear, clearly a demographic we're going to be missing. The second one is on partnerships, which I'm also sure is somewhere there on the slide. Um, Again, one of the key lessons from the COVID pandemic is to really to think about the human being as a whole. And I think that will be my parting shot for this uh, meeting in particular. I know it's uh, from the Canada Health Info where we spend time talking about uh, mental health and digital uh, ways to increase access to mental health. But let's remember that the individual is a whole and that all our interventions should be applied to the whole. So how could we leverage on existing platforms, platforms that are ensuring financial access, platforms that are uh, ensuring mobile telephony could be the same platforms that we use to access, uh, um, to ensure access to uh, health services, uh, mental health, uh, reproductive health, and, and, the, and a variety of others. And these partnerships require really to be within government. Uh, you find sometimes there are sectors doing Diff different pieces of different things. This is a question that is increasingly coming up. If I am a health worker and I walk up to your home, say a community health worker, and I find that you have no physical health problem or mental health problem, but you don't have a job or you don't have food for tonight, should I walk away and assume you're okay just because you don't have a uh, disease? And so how can we... Um, integrate probably our thinking as into the human being as opposed to the other way around, which is basically how we've spent a lot of our time uh, pursuing interventions. And the very last one is the indivisibility and the interdependability of, um, of humans and therefore interventions. So the digital health solutions, the M health solutions are not going to work if the other health system functions are weak, service delivery, supply chains, financing, uh, human resources, governance, and leadership. Thank you very, very much. And thank you, of course. And thank you, of course, Dr. Wengari, for that wonderful presentation. You know, it's so interesting to hear of how innovation has sparked worldwide, both in terms of mental health, but in terms of uh, the technological delivery of uh, healthcare more broadly. Uh, I really think that uh, in part because of this pandemic, perhaps uh, uh, in large part because of this pandemic, that it's really helped to add some rocket fuel into the innovation uh, of new services worldwide. And, you know, if we can find any silver lining here, maybe that. That's it. Mm. Now, I think we have uh, time for one or two questions for the audience. And the first one that I have for you here, of course, is uh, to take it local here in Canada. Um, we struggle with access issues uh, for people who live in rural and remote areas. You know, certainly in Canada's north, uh, some of the remote areas in the world in Canada's north. Uh, and it sounds like you're addressing those issues really very well uh, in Kenya. So what lessons can be learned that we might be able to import here uh, to our country? Thank you. Thank you for, for, for the question. I don't know if we are doing well or I just did a really good job of explaining um, <laughs> Um, but you know, I'll take I, I'll take I'll take the credit anyway, uh, and you know, relay the congratulations to the relevant sectors. Um, but perhaps maybe I'll answer that question with one of my parting shots, and really is to think through what services are able to get to the remote areas in Canada's north. 
if any, and, and ride on those. And they really could be the most unconventional. They could be food delivery systems. So if they are able to access food in some way, shape or form, uh, I, you know, I'm not sure that I know Canada's not that well, but if they're able to access food, um, this is a good example that came from Zambia a few years ago that um, used a Coca-Cola delivery system, being one of the most uh, efficient in the world, to deliver anti-diarrheal medications. So it's to think through some of the delivery functions that are working, service delivery functions across whichever sector doesn't have to be health, and how could we ride on those? Mm-hmm. Um, it's also to li- to pay attention to what the human being wants. It's had to be quite a challenge for 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 us. Uh, and I give a fairly crude example. Uh, please don't take this literally. <laughs> but I've had times where I've had to speak to communities about what type of health services that they would like brought closer to them. And there are health communities that have to, there are communities that have to travel in excess of two hundred kilometers, three hundred, four hundred kilometers to reach the nearest health facility. And the resounding answer to what service they would like brought closer to them is usually a mortuary. And that goes against everything I would imagine because, you know, I would rather, you know, try and keep you healthy for longer. Um, That's what they want because they have another way in which they access uh, health services as we know them. So to try and understand the community and come from where and understand where they're coming from and how they already address some of the challenges they have um, starts bringing you that much closer to bridging that divide uh, rather than you know the traditional top-down approach. This is how you access services, and so therefore you must be able to access it the manner in which is it, it is acceptable for Mark or Wangari. So does someone else? Um, maybe that's not what they want. Well, thank you so much for that. And we did have more questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I could listen to you speak about these and and share your expertise all day. Unfortunately, we can't. So thank you again, Dr. Wengari, for uh, joining us today and sharing your knowledge. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you to the Canada Health Info team. Thank you. So we're going to look for your thoughts on one more live poll. We're not going to have it up there very long, so I just want to make reference to it. It'd be great if you can give us your feedback. And since we are at the end, I just want to thank you all for joining us again for this second installment in the series. Uh, It's really a privilege for me to be able to learn so much from so many experts across the country. So thank you to Canada Health Info Way for that. If you missed any parts uh, of this today, or if your colleagues are asking for some of the recording, the recording of the event will be available by the end of the week. So please watch for the wrap-up email that'll be coming to your inbox. Uh, And thanks again, of course, to the Access 2022 Alliance founding sponsors. We could not do this without the sponsors. So really thank you to them. Uh, Let's head over to uh, the uh, survey. I want to mention the survey that we're going to be putting up here. The team at InfoWay really appreciates your feedback on this. It helps to make these events and and future events uh, all the much better when you provide your feedback. So uh, complete the evaluation. You see the QR code up there on the screen right now. Uh, The link can be found in the chat as well. Digital Health Week is coming up. So save the date for this, mark it in your calendars, pull out your phone right now and put in a a notification in there. Uh, A special thank you to everyone who joined today uh, for your participation. Uh, We're gonna see you back here during Digital Health Week on November 17th. So put that memo in your phone for November 17th. Uh, Once again, thank you to all the guests. Thank you to you uh, for joining us today. I'm Mark Hennick. It's been a real pleasure chatting with you yet again, and we'll see you again on the 17th.